Um, so I guess we'll get underway. Um, so um, past summits, for a lot of you have been to past summits, some of you haven't, but these conversations have been really easy to spark because we've literally all been at the same table. Um, so this is a little bit trickier, but um, to spark the conversation about what publishers need and the conversation around certification, we have some panelists here. So uh, uh, in case you didn't know, my name is Laura Brady. I work for the House of the Nancy Press as the director of cross media. Um, and I'm a well-known accessibility busybody apparently. Um, uh, can the other panelists please introduce themselves and explain how they come at uh, the question of accessibility? Deb, do you wanna go first? Sure, good afternoon, everyone. My name's uh, Deborah Nelson. I'm uh, CEO of eBound. Ebound is um, what we fondly refer to ourselves as our digital sales and marketing department for the Canadian independent publishers. Our focus this year is to support accessibility both through conversion projects and through um, a Benetech certification pilot. Chantel. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Chantal Rido from Atlantic Publishers Marketing Association. I'm the manager of programming and member services here and have been leading the um, two collective uh, projects that we have under the uh, Canada Book Fund collective projects for support for organizations. We've uh, wrapped up a recent project with Nels and we're working on a pilot project right now with an accessible ebooks collection with our libraries in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Jillian, do you want to go next? I do. I'm Jillian Bell. I work with Sask Books. We're the Provincial Book Publishing Association in Saskatchewan. And we have the majority of publishers in Saskatchewan um, don't have six staff, each of whom might do five jobs. Most of our publishers have one staff or no staff. And most of our publishers don't qualify for federal supports. So what we're doing at Sask Books is trying to really create an environment where it's easy for publishers to develop a born accessible workflow. And we're looking at ways to support that so that we can get more Canadian content, more accessible Canadian content available across the country. Um, sorry, my kid is texting me. I got distracted, apologies. Uh, Matt, do you wanna go next? Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Matt Chan. I am the cross media assistant at House of Nancy slash Brentwood Books, uh, working with Laura. Uh, my perspective on this is mainly that of a production staff member. Um, I work on a day to day basis to make sure that these born accessible concepts that we are discussing are a part of the content that we make at Anansi. Thank you. And finally, Kieran. I think you're muted, Kieran. Sorry about that. I lost my mouse. I've got two screens going on here. <laughs> Speaking of tech savvy. Um, so I'm Kieran LeBlanc, Executive Director of the Book Publishers Association in Alberta. Um, I've been involved in uh, accessible publishing for quite a number of years, starting back in 2016 when we did our first um, e-audiobook, accessible e-audiobook project in partnership with the CNIB. And we're about to uh, enter into our fifth iteration of that. Um, we also have an ebook collection available through the public libraries in Alberta, um, which is also shared with NELS. So NELS has had access to our content uh, for conversion purposes since 2017. And we're currently in the process of a conversion project with um, through the Digital Accessible Publishing uh, Fund. Uh, have been working with Sarah on two phases of the project, uh, and we're well into phase two right now. Um, so it's something that I've been very interested in and um, familiar with and care about. So awesome. Okay, so let's just dive right in. Um, the needs of publishers are complex, evolving and numerous, and they're also varied depending on the size of the publisher and the resources at their disposal, as we all well know. Um, 
So what do publishers need in order to build accessible books? Anybody can jump in here. Do we need training? Do we need better support? Um, better technical knowledge? What, like where, where should we be focusing our time and attention? I think this is a good question. Oh. Go ahead, Deb. Great, sorry, sorry for the interruption. I think we both- No worries. We're inspired to talk at the same time. Just from a really high level, um, I, I think that publishers need to um, and this is like before even the commitment is developed, um, understand why it's so important to do this. Like, why are we, what's the moral compulsion behind this work and why is it so important? And I think going through like the tester demos like we did yesterday was so incredibly impactful. Um, I think to de debunk the myths that this is, you know, as big as creating eBooks um, like 10 years ago, I think that myth needs to be debunked as well by talking to others that have gone through that process. I think it's not as complex as people may believe. Um, and I think you need experts around you to, to support you, um, many of which we've heard from today. And there's so many wonderful you know, services and supports and, and expertise around that. Um, you know, I, I think we're set up for success in this work. Matt, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think this is a good, like almost a softball question to start off the conversation because to me, and I don't know, maybe I'm just underthinking it, but it's not that um, complicated. There needs to be the um, philosophical aspect almost like um, to what uh, Deb was just mentioning, the, the why of, of it and the motivations behind it. And then also the how piece, you know, what are the tools involved? And, and how do we actually implement um, what we need to implement? I think from the perspective of really small publishers and micro publishers, there's, there's a, a piece here that really plays off of what Deb was talking about. And when we look at Canadian publishing, there's a lot of publishing that's going on that isn't necessarily being done by mid-sized houses. And I think if that philosophical piece about why producing accessible content and accessible metadata is made available for people who want to self-publish or hybrid publish um, or produce websites and blogs, that kind of information and, and that why piece is going to be integral because in order to get born accessibility as part of um, just an automatic go-to workflow across the publishing spectrum, you have to address that piece first. And, and so um, I think that's, that's actually a really, really important answer that, that addressing the why it's important is really integral. Yeah, and, and I'll jump in to agree with, with everything everybody said. Um, I actually spoke to a couple of publishers before the panel and, um, and one of the things one of them said to me was, it's, uh, it's definitely not about making money, it's about doing it because it's the right thing to do. Um, and so there's that intrinsic value around um, making books accessible to everyone so that the, the work that publishers does is out there for everyone. Um, and, I, and I would add to that, um, the, the question of time actually came up as the biggest challenge for a couple of my publishers, um, especially in the area of creating the alt text. Uh, for some publishers who have complicated alt text, it's very, very time consuming. Um, one example one publisher gave me was there's a book with 200 images and every single image has to have alt text created and their publishing house is three people and so it's just the real the reality of um, just human resources. That's a really, um, that's a really great point to bring up here we. Um... I just tasked one of my colleagues with writing alt text for an 80 page graphic novel this morning and um, she wasn't very amused. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a big thing. And 
um, at Groundwood, they're really paying attention to making sure that the language that they use in the alt text reflects the language in the book, that they're not using terms that are out of sync with the tone and the content of the book. And they're also speaking at reading level, which can make it even, even more complex. Um, that does feel like an area where publishers will 100% need some support um, without question. Well, and one of one of the ways that this one publisher is tackling it is they're they're doing an experiment to see if the author can actually create the alt text hmm. uh, as part of the process of writing the book and hmm. going through the editorial process. Mm -hmm. And they've had a lot of pushback from the author because it feels like a really onerous piece that isn't it doesn't feel like it's part of writing the book for the author. So it'll be interesting to see how that um, kind of develops. Hmm. I, I feel it feels it really feels to me like if you're thinking about accessibility and folding it into every part of the publishing um, supply chain, then you can write in the the task of having to write the alt text into the publisher's contract, just like um, you know, the publisher that we work for, we never pay for indexing. If the author wants an index, that's their responsibility, and that's written into the contract. This can be something that can be can be thought about at that level as well. Um, Chantal, I think you had your hand raised a second ago. Do you want to weigh in? Oh, I was just going to add, um, just similar to Kieran, we, we have some responses from our publishers a, a bit ahead of this, and, and we also did a survey with, with Nels and eBound um, recently to the Atlantic publishers that addressed a, a similar question to this. And it was interesting, one need that was listed across, almost across the board for everyone who answered our survey was better access to technology. But what became clear as Nels continued to work with our publishers throughout the project was what they really meant or what they didn't know that they meant was more of an understanding about what free technology is available. So BB Edit, Sigil, Ecan Crusher, like just not when you're a new publisher and you're and you're just wading into this world, not I guess it's it's really overwhelming and and assuming maybe that there is a lot of costly technology and and having a regional or national publishing association to help uh, narrow down some of the resources that are available and and making those helping publishers make those connections can be really valuable. That's a great that's a great thing. Uh, Charles, I think you had your hand up next. Sure. Um, totally agree with you, Laura, on that writing into the contracts for the authors, because the author knows why they're putting in an image into a book. So they they have an idea behind it. Sometimes they even have, like, they don't even find the image. They give some instructions to someone else to find that image. Well, those instructions has some information on it that could be used for the alt text description. So uh, I think that, um, and we're seeing that a lot of conversion vendors for uh, bigger publishers that are using those services, they can actually start writing, they're starting to write the alt text or there's other consulting agencies out there that are starting to pop up like Textbox, um, Hugh Alexander's uh, company and others that are starting to write this. So, you know, if, you know, and they charge per image and depending on the complexity. So simple images might be a couple bucks, whereas a complex image might be like up to $12, $15. Um, you know, if there's an extended description that also needs. So these are some other ideas. And maybe I don't know if the that heritage money could be potentially used for helping publishers with that extended cost. I don't know, but I'm just throwing it out there that, that that's what we're starting to see anyway. Um, Matt Chan, see, you had your hand up next, I think. Yeah, I wanted to say that, um, like in the context of a smaller, like micro publisher that wants to make themselves born accessible, maybe don't start with your 80 page graphic novel as like mm. the test case or like the 100 page book where there's a picture on every um, page. E you know, if that smaller micro publishers domain is like the lifestyle book where that is going to be the norm, then yes, obviously this is something that you have to grapple with. But to echo something that Laura mentioned in the, the session this morning is it's baby steps, you know, like just start, just start, you know, do what you can and then like work up to 
the 80 page graphic novel. That's a really good point. Sarah, Sarah Hilderly. I think you're muted, Sarah. Sorry, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to follow on from Laura and Charles's point about the author preparing alt text. I think in some cases, particularly where you're trying to echo the language and the style of language within the text, that's a wonderful idea. But we mustn't forget that alt text and the um, well, the preparation of alt text is is a skill. It's not it's not something that's as, it's not as easy as writing a caption for instance for a, for a, for a picture and people are being trained to to prepare um, meaningful alt text written within the context of the situation that the image is placed and so i think for some for more technical projects um, medical books um, art books on art it it's really worth um, using the skills of the experts. So I think what I'm trying to say is alt text is really dependent on the genre and the, and the type of image that you are describing. That's really, really good point. Um, it is a skill. At Anansi, we've actually hired this um, organization called NELS. Don't know if you heard of them. They're gonna do image description training for us next week. Everyone in editorial is required to attend, which, um, just feels like real progress for us. Um, Jillian, do you have, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, it, it's just um, like my colleagues in, in Alberta and in the Maritimes, I, our publishers replied also to the question, what do you need? And, and of our publishers who replied, uh, one of our premier book designers in the province really needs hands-on workshops, hands-on training. Mm -hmm. um, they're not comfortable working with code. They're not comfortable working with tags. They, they run screaming from having to do the metadata portion of their, of their design work. And so uh, I think that some of the tools that both Nels is putting out and Daisy has available, I think those are going to become really important because it's not that it's a difficult process. It's that if you've, if you've come to book production from a certain place, those relatively simple interventions that will create good books can be daunting. And so I think that that training piece is, is really important. And also because here in our wonderful province, um, we don't have a lot of people who are trained in book production yet. So, <laughs> so it's gonna be helpful in the long run. Mm -hmm. I feel like that piece is really critical, just hands-on, uh, somebody literally holding your hand through the process and uh, walking you through those first baby steps, for sure. Thad, I think you're next. You had your hand raised. Okay, thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. I, I've got a couple of questions, but I'll just do one at a time and I can come back into the conversation with the second one. Uh, Matt, you, you said it's not that complicated. You know, the publishers need to realize it's not that complicated. And when you say that, I'm I'm thinking of a couple of things. Um, I can circle back around, but the way I see the complexity of it, you know, I've been training publishers for two decades, let's say, on two primary technologies, XML first, and more recently on metadata. And my experience with those two technologies is, my God, it's so you know, it's a huge leap for them to get past just that initial stage and thus far with accessibility the publishers i'm speaking to you know yes i agree with you matt it, it isn't really you know all that complicated but getting them past that first doorway I, I i lose them as i do when i lose you know when i used to talk about xml when i do talk currently about metadata when i first say to them you know accessibility let's talk about what your company could be doing around that and there's just this kind of pull back. I, I wonder what other people are experiencing around that sort of first door of complexity when they start talking about accessibility. I, I meant to preface my comments by saying that um, it's easy for me to, you know, say the things that I've said, being immersed in doing this sort of thing 
every day for like eight hours a day versus you who have to like face down the the small <laughs> publisher and say like listen we really want you to do this i i can't even imagine mm. but the folks who are running the publishing associations you're you're encountering that first moment with many of your clients how do you find that that first stage with them it's huge for a lot of our publishers um even a lot of our publishers are still and and this even includes our our primary publishers who sell you know hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of books every year um they're not they're not comfortable with xml they're not comfortable with and most of them will farm that farm that work out to you know to do that product production elsewhere uh but i think that there's a that that first step is huge people are so intimidated when it comes to any kind of tech babble this, that's how they see it and just having to hold their hands and say look this this really isn't that intimidating let's just walk through it step by step and it'll be easy they don't believe you <laughs> you yeah. might as well be speaking klingon yeah. Yeah. one thing i think is that it is helpful to both give them um to give publishers the the kind of resources for why i mean we circle right back to that initial thing that we started this conversation with there is a business case for to be made for publishing accessibly and the business case is even clearer when you take into account dch funding like that is huge and it really is um putting the money putting uh, the government's money where their mouth is that this is supported and this does make it easier um but there is a business case you will sell more books the the clients will borrow those books from the libraries you know you will get more views and if you can make the business case it may make it a little bit easier um, on top of it is really the right thing to do. Um, Kieran, I think you had your hand up. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to share um, when we were in phase one of the digital accessible project, one of the things we needed to do to get an estimate for the conversion work was to figure out what kind of complexity the alt text was. And so we asked publishers to evaluate their titles and say whether it was simple, medium, or complex. And I realized very quickly they didn't know how to do that because they didn't know what simple, medium, or complex alt text was. Um, and so we had a webinar with Nels uh, in the summertime to do exactly that training that you're talking about, Laura. Um, and as soon as that, as soon as they had that experience, it's like it became clearer and less intimidating. But at the beginning, they didn't know where to even start with that. Sorry, I need to unmute myself there. I couldn't find the button. And when people stop talking, the, the screen moves and then I don't know what to do. Um, Charles, I think you were next. Sure. Um, so on this thing of, uh, for micro publishers that are like, don't know how to do XML and things, I think knowing that there's this new thing from Daisy word to EPUB is going to be huge because I'll give you a story. In December, I created my first EPUB and I've been looking at EPUBs for the last four or five years now but this is the first time I actually created one from scratch using their tool. And I was able to have a really complex book created. Now I had to go in and manually edit some things afterwards, especially after it failed my own certification. So that was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> but using those tools to tell me, oh yeah, by the way, you did this wrong or you did that wrong. And it's like, oh my goodness, uh, was, you know, it's an eye opener for me. And so I'm like walking the walk but I was able to create an EPUB, which I've never done before. So I think, and these these books are, you know, nine times out of 10 will be perfect coming out of the gate from a word to EPUB conversion. So if you put the images in with the alt text descriptions in Microsoft Word, that will get pulled over into an EPUB. And then you can add in some other things like the accessibility metadata and, and the like, but even some of that is starting to be built into that tool as well. So I, th I think what's going to happen is we're going to start to see some training sessions on how to use Word to EPUB and, and these publishers or self-publishers can start 
creating amazing books just by using that free tool by Daisy. So, yeah. It does raise the question though of forking production because word is usually where the manuscript ends and the book, uh, the, the formation of the book starts. So if you stop editing at word and then go into InDesign and to EPUB, if you make any editorial changes to the page layout, then you're gonna have to make them twice, which um, makes it a little bit more complex, especially for micro publishers. Um, I don't know who's next. There's four hands raised and I lost track of who goes next. I think Matt was next actually. Matt doesn't have his hand raised. Don't confuse me, Nan. <laughs> Chantel, do you want to go next? Sure. I just add another response to, to Thad's question there um, from, from our experience. So with the project um, that we had just finished with Nels and Ebound that was funded by the Canada Book Fund Collective Projects, we, uh, we also surveyed our members about the complexity of their books and also both their needs. And then we moved from that into file reviews and one-on-one -on -one opportunities to work one-on-one -on -one with okay. Nels. And then coming from Nels built some custom PD coming out of that. So our publishers had indicated that they felt the, the general videos um, and the, thinking about it in more abstract terms was difficult for them just starting, especially with so many of them being quite small and having really niche publishing programs. So what we were able to do was to offer some, some training that is on the topics that come up over and over, of course, like image descriptions, but really tailored to the publishers um, who are part of APMA. So they felt a lot more comfortable having it personalized that way. Um, and we did just have one publisher who had never created an ebook before, who was able to um, work with Nels through the program to create their first ebook and, of course, their first accessible ebook. So I think that, yeah, that kind of baby steps and that personalization can be really helpful to get things started. That's wonderful. I love to hear that. That's really great. Um, I, I, I love that. And then they're producing, they don't know how to not make an accessible ebook. So that's, I see, I see crazy like a fox there. Um, Thad, I believe you're next. Do we stop in a few minutes? Because this is a long question. I can withdraw it for later. Well, the thing is that this conversation goes on actually to the end of today's session. We can stop and have breaks, but we can keep talking about publisher needs and certification right up until uh, uh, four o'clock my time or whatever time zone you're in. Like the rest of today is unstructured in that we're trying to just solve problems. So we can keep going. It doesn't matter if your question is kind of long. Okay, so this, this is a very tentative question. Um, you know, quite a bit of the talk we have around accessibility, um, you know, and as it was just said, you know, it's not about doing money, it's about um, doing it because it's the right thing to do. And, you know, I certainly embrace that, but run into then the second part of the problem is, you know, once I get them past complexity, or once I engage them in the conversation about complexity, then it's like, well, why would I want to do this? What's well, the right thing to do? Yeah, yeah, well, I got many other right things I got to do or many other things that I simply need to do from a business perspective. Then, then you know, Laura, you make the point that in Canada at this point, well, you can get funded to do that. But again, they don't come out ahead with that. They cover their costs. They haven't sold more books. So then the, the question to the group, and this is all very tentative in my head, is that if you've created a born accessible EPUB 3, can that not be substituted in all the commercial channels for the current EPUB that you're selling through Kobo, Amazon, well, leave out Amazon for a second, you know, let's say Kobo, Apple, the folks who are taking EPUB directly, could, can you substitute that one, hence opening up the market that folks who are print disabled don't have to wait for books to go through the whole you know, Nell's chain and not be available to them for another eight months or whatever it takes, but could actually buy that book on day one, thereby creating a new revenue source, potential revenue source for publishers. Does that make any sense at all? Well, I can, I can, uh, I can tell you what we do at Anansi. We only make one version of any product and it's accessible EPUB 3. And that goes to the entire supply chain. So, that accessible EPUB 3 
um, fulfills a lot of uh, print disabled readers needs, not all of them. And then that's where Nels comes in to make a Daisy talking book or to um, um, make an embossed braille edition that that those kinds of tasks sit with specialists like Nels and Sela in this country. Um, does does that answer your question? Do other people want to weigh in? I wonder just a quick follow up would be, you know, that's the one you offer. Do the people who I mean, so that means everyone who bought the old EPUB 3 pre-accessibility, they won't even notice the difference in terms of what they're buying. It all, it all looks the same to them. But is it a metadata problem that we don't expose to the print disabled community that if this EPUB 3 works for you, you know, you can buy it on day one, the same day everybody else bought the new, you know, hottest mm -hmm. new novel. Um, so is there then, you know, that incremental revenue opportunity should those people become aware of the availability of said book. Right. So um, the, the one piece here is that, you know, a, a well-made EPUB that's fully accessible is a better reading experience for every single consumer. That's an important point to make here. A really well-made ebook is better for everyone throughout the supply, through every kind of reader that comes to the book. So it's got better navigation. It's a, a more seamless. You can increase the font size or change the font more seamlessly. So those kinds of ebooks are better for everybody. And now I forgot what your question was. I wanted to say that and then- well, I saw Kate poof. raise her hand that it's the discoverability problem. Yes, like yes. If, if no Kate, do you wanna come in? That, yeah, Kate. Sure, I think Thad made the point already that I was going, going to is that I think you're right. Um, and in opening that commercial channel for print disabled readers, and this was touched on in, in the panel that started today, um, being able to expose that metadata and to make sure that those platforms are accessible as well. Um, that's, I, I think, a barrier at the moment yeah. to, um, to that piece. Yeah. That work is underway and ongoing. I understand mm -hmm. that COBOL will be exposing metadata fairly soon, like some point this year. So that will be a really big deal, especially in Canada. Um, Jillian, I think that you're next on the hand raising chain. Sorry, I confused you before. Um, okay. I was confused between Matt and Tad. Okay, uh, the one thing that I wanted to say is that when we talk about barriers, when it comes to, to publishers and what they need, I, I can't state enough how important it is to know that the Department of Canadian Heritage does not support all publishers in Canada. Mm -hmm. They support a very small number of publishers, a very small number of brilliant and wonderful publishers. Mm -hmm. But the bigger challenge becomes how to make sure that if you have a new publisher who is an Indigenous publishing house who's just starting up, for example, and they don't, they will not be able to get DCH support. They won't qualify for those programs. So that's why it's so important to talk about how making accessible books from the get-go is really important and how to build that sustainability into your publishing model, whether you're just starting up, whether you're a micro publisher, whether you're a self publisher. Um, because while it's good that the, that the federal government has, like you said, put their money where their mouth is, and we need this in the publishing sector, it's not accessible to all publishers. And so that, that piece of the how-to piece becomes even more important and the supports and, and um, programs and, and solutions that are out there from people like the DAISY Consortium then become that much more important because those are accessible. I muted myself, oops. Um, Charles, I think you're next. Sure. Um... So I just wanted to mention that uh, we don't have to get accessibility perfect. And the accessibility 1.0 specification that, um, that we're using for certification, et cetera, basically has the bar set kind of low for publishers, uh, specifically around the um, 
uh, image descriptions, the alt text descriptions. WCAG, even single A requires, you know, that images that are complex have a, a extended description. But we've actually put in uh, like an amendment to to the specification that says, you know what, we just want publishers to put in something, just a summary of that image in the alt text description. And then if an image required a complex description, just note that if you can't do it, note that in the accessibility summary that there's, you know, basic alt text descriptions, but the complex images are not, uh, don't have that um, that affordance that doesn't have that ex, uh, extended description. So, and that those books can still pass, you know, uh, at least saying that it's, um, you know, that it's, uh, that it can be certified. Uh, now with our certification program, we're, we want publishers to get to that double A requirement and have that extended description, but you could definitely put in that you are at least meeting the minimum bar uh, for accessibility with that simple alt text description. Sarah, Mays, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, to address Jillian and the question about Canada Book Fund and what we fund and what we don't fund. Uh, I, I think, and I'm, um, biased, um, but I think that that's where collective initiatives can really play a key role and working with a lot of you guys and the publishing associations, because I think that, you know, once we start building tools and training that can be delivered by regional and national associations that may cover publishers that we're not able to reach because they're not large enough for support for publishers, um, I think that that's a really key piece and it's certainly one that we recognize within the department. And we thank you very much. We're doing some accessibility programming that's, des that's designed specifically for that. So it's awesome. Uh, one of the great things about all the people assembled in this room here is that it really is um, publishers and support organizations from coast to coast. Um, and that's a real strength of this conversation. Um, um, and the publisher support organizations, I think, are key, especially for the small publishers, as I said a little while ago in the main room. Do some of you want to talk about the programs that are ongoing for small publishers and the kinds of things that people can tap into and take advantage of and where exciting work is being done? Since I was being the stick in the mud, I can start. <laughs> um, so I, uh, at Sask Books, one of the programs that we're undertaking with support from collective initiatives actually is a born accessible audiobooks and ebooks mentorship program where we are matching up publishers with producers in hopefully in Saskatchewan <clears throat> but also across the country to learn those um, best practices and to develop um, to develop those books. We're also producing uh, a born accessible audiobook subsidy to allow those smaller publishers who, who aren't necessarily able to tap into uh, some of the provincial and federal supports to be able to produce audiobooks and, and accessible audiobooks. And we're also developing the developers and the producers in the province. So we're offering workshops to audiobook developers and to ebook producers um, and designers to get them up to snuff on <clears throat> certification standards and to make sure that we have the capacity in Saskatchewan to do and hopefully for Western Canada to, because we dream big, to be able to, to get those books out in the market. Love it. I feel like developing um, local talent who can do the actual work is uh, critical to this being a success long term. Um, so I'm really happy to hear that. Anybody else? Deb, I was wondering if you want to talk about the Publisher Resource Kit project that you have ongoing. Yeah, um, thank you, Laura. So I touched on it quickly yesterday, and the intent of this Publisher Resource Project is to, um, to sort of put our arms around really specific content 
that'll help publishers where they are. And it kind of tweaked me when um, Chantal was talking about how the Atlantic publishers felt much more engaged when the content was specific to them, respecting where their starting point is. Um, as we know, there's so many different workflows. There's probably, you know, there's probably almost as many workflows as there are publishers. Mm -hmm. I know that's overstating it a little bit, but if you can go into a place and find specifically your workflow that speaks specifically to what you have to do next, we find, we feel, and based on the research through the landscape research report, that that's going to accelerate our agenda. So highly searchable, highly specific, quality tested content that will deliver the standards that we're, we're trying to get towards. Um, Matt Chan, I wonder if you want to talk for a minute about certification and what that process was like from your point of view for Nancy. Uh, sure, I'd love to. Uh, Nancy Granwood is currently certified by the like we're covered by the Benetech GCA um, certification. And what that is, is it's a workflow certification. So we're not looking at um, going in and certifying individual books, rather the process that we go through is um, it's front end loaded where we have three titles um, audited for um, accessibility best practice by um, accessibility experts at Benetech. And through this auditing process, the point is um, to remediate those three titles, of course, but, uh, more to, but more importantly, to remediate the process through which those three titles were created. So the workflow, as we were just talking about. Um, and then after those three titles are kind of checked and audited, that workflow that was used to produce those three books is covered by the certification for the process of a year, after which point, um, you know, we'll have to go through recertification just to keep us up to date with all the advances that have happened over the past year. Charles, do you want to jump in here and talk a little bit more about the certification process? Sure, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, uh, it was great working with uh, House of Anansi and yourselves uh, on that. and. You know, uh, the, the process actually is, you know, um, we don't want all three books at first and, and evaluate all three books. What we want to do is get one book at a time and then we give our feedback. We find out where the issues potentially are and we actually give code examples back to, you know, to the publisher saying this is what you did and this is and then we highlight and, you know, tell you exactly what we would like to see changed on it and we also have like that whole idea about a simple book versus a media um, moderate book or a complex book so we can evaluate you know and tell you what level of book are you is this a simple trade book or you know a complex stem book or someplace in between um and then once we've given that multiple reports there's one from ace there's one from smart uh there's a very detailed technical report that I just explained that, you know, goes into each issue. And some of them are like must fix issues like a WCAG violation or a accessibility 1.0 specification violation. Whereas others are like in the gray area that are some strongly suggested things that we would like to see. And then some best practices that are minor that, uh, you know, would be nice for you to, to fix. So, in our certification process and our reports that we give you, we give you a score. We tell you how you're doing. Um, and if there's, you know, first and foremost, if there was any WCAG violations, must fix. But then we give you a score overall, basically telling you, you know, are you at 80%, you know, there, or are you closer to 90 or 100%? And this is like a bar that you can then use, and you don't have to get 100% to pass certification. You just need to get above 80% and fix all of the must fixes or all of those WCAG violations. And we work with you. We like if you don't understand what, what we what we re reported, then we set up a call and we go over it and we dive into the book and we get into the nitty gritty and we we come up with a solution because there's not one solution that fits all either. Like there's multiple ways to do something 
and we could give you a recommendation. If that doesn't work for you, we'll come up with a, a new recommendation. And the thing is, you can always ask us questions too. So if there's something that you're putting into your book that you've never done before, uh, say a media, like a video or a, some sound, and you're like, how do I make this accessible? That's what we're here for. So then we will, and if I don't know the answer, if our, my team doesn't know the answer, then we start to go look out to the broader uh, industry, you know, because we have friends in the W3C, we have Daisy, we have, you know, there's a lot of folks. And sometimes I even go to Laura and say, hey, Laura, <laughs> how do you do this? You know, uh, I, just, I think you've done this before, you know, it's like drop caps. How do you make those accessible? Like there's a lot of little things that a lot of small publishers would have no idea. And they just like, okay, if I, I got it to work, and then we're like, uh, yeah, except in this reading system, it like spells out the word now instead of reading that full word because of the drop cap, the way that you implemented it. So then once that first book finally passes, then we're like, okay, great. Make sure that you're not fixing just that book because anyone can do that because we give you the code to do it. We want you to fix your pipeline, like uh, Matt mentioned, and then give us a new book off that production pipeline, hopefully something that we haven't seen before, maybe something that has a table that you didn't have in or math uh, in it, MathML, and then we'll look at that and give you recommendations so that by the third time, we feel confident that you've met that bar and can pass certification and that you know what you're doing. And like Laura said, then, you know, once uh, after a year, then we'll do a spot check. In addition to all that, we also give out quarterly bulletins to to the um, our uh, GCA members that basically says this is what's going on in the standard space. This is what's changing. Uh, here's some new changes that we've seen because we're seeing all of these different publishers do things differently. And something that might not have been on our radar before, it's like, oh shoot, and we don't even have a thing in our in our uh, checklist to to look at. So we then add a new new check and that we'll say that you know in a month's time we're going to start checking your books for that and anything new when we do your spot check be aware that we're also going to be looking for how you're doing drop caps for example if you're if you have that so that's sort of the thing i'm happy i'm going to be here today and tomorrow uh and you know happy to answer any questions on slack or my email um yeah that's uh just feel free to ask me any questions uh, on this because it's Super exciting. We already have like six publishers now that have passed certification and ANSI uh, being one of them here in Canada. And then um, six conversion vendors, because we're actually working with the conversion vendors as well to get them to create accessible books for their publishers. So um, we're trying to <laughs> fight the fire on both ends, you know, so thanks. Thanks, Charles. I think one of the real strengths of the Benetech program is that it's iterative and it can be an education in and of itself as you send ebooks back and forth. Um, I know Matt and I learned things in the process with Benetech. I thought I knew everything. I, I don't know everything. Things change and develop. It's a vibrant space. It's dynamic and it's always moving. And the real strength is that there's you can go back and forth with this series of ebooks and correct your mistakes and then build those corrections into your workflow. Sad, I think you're next. You had your hand raised. I think you need to unmute, Sad. Uh, you're muted. There you go. Yeah, thanks. Apologies for dominating questions. I'm it's just it's such a great panel and a chance for me to learn a bunch of things. Uh, on this certification, when I saw Nancy got it, I was like, wow, that's great. And I also do some work with Canadian Electronic Library and they got certification as a, a Benetech vendor, Benetech certified vendor. And that was a big deal for Bob Gibson. I know he put a lot of work into that, which got me interested again in publisher certification. And as I looked at that, I thought, wow, this is a great branding, a real potential for branding as part of this um, discoverability of you know where you can get um, fully accessible books that you know are, are produced at a quality that 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 the market is looking for but then obviously from what charles is describing there's a degree of complexity in 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 that whole process then what i'm the real question is is what is the actual cost what's the cash outlay with the corollary being corollary being um, therefore what size and scope of publisher is this reasonable for the to be able to say Yes, you should pursue this certification. 
Right. Um, great question. I actually, uh, Michael Johnson is really uh, part of uh, at Benetech uh, leading the development, uh, the business side of things. But um, it's it, it based on the complexity of your books. So if you're a small trade, co- you know, that's very simple books. And that's why we have that scale of uh, simple, moderate or complex books. That also changes the amount, um, the cost the structure as well. But for something like a simple book, I think it's, I don't know, 1500 or 2000 for um, for certification. Um, and then it drops for the yearly. It's it's not the same price. So uh, but I, you know, I'm I'm don't know the exact numbers, um, but it's under, you know, for the most complex books, that's still under $10,000 um, for what some of the bigger publishers that are doing like STEM books that requires us to spend hours going through this, um, you know, for looking at these uh, very technical books and looking over the image descriptions to make sure that they're valid and making sure that you're doing your complex tables and your, you know, some of these more advanced things uh, correctly, uh, like MathML, et cetera. So that's why there's a scale and uh, we'd be happy to like go over that with you. Um, you know, and, and Michael would be the, the person to to sort of walk you through all of that. Um, but uh, yeah, we try to, you know, not try to meet publishers where they are as well. So I know that uh, we have made those those uh, adjustments and we've we piloted this like six, five, six years ago um, and found out here in the U.S. what where publishers were um, were happy you know where they were comfortable with and per book certification didn't fly so they wanted a fixed price and so you know it doesn't matter you know we're hoping that three books is going to be enough but some publishers were up to like seven or eight books that we're looking at for them before they become certified but they're not paying that in you know that cost and uh because we've we've done it as a more of a you know a certification price not per book price but there's other publishers like you know what, we would rather just pay per book. Okay, well, we could work with you on that too, if you'd rather it that way. Um, so th- we, we're pretty flexible. Thank you. I would love to pause here and let Deb tell us about the um, certification pilot that's happening at eBound, um, which is, this is exactly the right spot to hear about it, I think. Great. Thank you, Laura, for the segue. I did post it in the chat. I didn't want to interrupt. Um, Our business model at this point is a little different than what has just been described. Um, Because of the funding and because of the parameters put around this pilot, which is, um, one, assessing if the tool works for our publishers, and two, trying to assess the cost of scaling this, participating publishers will move towards certification at no cost to them, besides a commitment to people hours and human effort and um, a a commitment to actually complete the process. So we've got, we've licensed the Benetech certification program um, until the end of this calendar year, at which point we'll stop, pause, reflect, and uh, decide what our next steps are gonna be. Thanks, Laura. It's a major opportunity, especially for teeny publishers. Um, Matt Chan, I think you have your hand raised. Thanks, Laura. Just on the note of the the people hours, having um, just very recently gone through that certification process ourselves, I want to reassure everyone who's listening that the hours are not, like it it is absolutely not an onerous process. There are um, uh, resources out there if um, you want to gear up for accessibility on your own. There's the JC knowledge, knowledge Base, which is great and free. And there are um, a number of best practices documents like the um, W3C EPUB accessibility specs techniques document. Um, but quite often, if you choose to go that kind of DIY route, um, the amount of time that you're going to be investing is quite high versus if you want to go for something like Benetech GCA, the point that I want to underscore, which Charles made, 
is that it is a guided process. And the examples are not generic examples that you would find, for example, in a knowledge base or in a techniques document, but there are examples using your own books. Um, so that can oftentimes be a great time saver. Thank you. So it, it, it feels like now would be a good time to circle. Oh, Brendan, go ahead. Sorry, I just noticed you. Thanks. It oh, was thanks. a fast reaction. I just put my hand up. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, so Anik Press, where I work, is a children's publisher. Um, we've had uh, all kinds of interesting uh, conversations around accessibility. And I'm wondering if the certification is uh, at a point where it makes clear recommendations on changes in workflow. Because our understanding is at a point, I would say, where we can remediate, but we can't yet implement across the whole staff accessibility uh, features. And, and born accessible feels like, to me, for, for a picture book, for example, um, we are structuring images as they are finalized and, and, and writing alt text for them and thinking about some of the things that Laura and Matt have been talking about with continuity and voice and age level and all of these things are special considerations as, as far as uh, other conversations I've had with the uh, with colleagues in the industry thus far. So um, just to share that that is where my thinking is at. And, and uh, um, maybe Charles, if you want to give some more insight into the Benetech cert or you know, hearing about other experiences and, and workflows would be really welcome. Well, I know that we, we've actually worked with um, Ikataboo, uh, this publisher doing some children's books um, over in Asia. Uh, and they were part of this WIPO um, project. Um, and they had us evaluate their, their children's books, uh, which we found some issues with. And the, the biggest thing is put your book into a reading system like that you're expecting your readers to be, in, uh, to be use and turn on the, uh, either the self-voicing feature of that, like read aloud, and see how it does. Like, does it, you know? And hopefully, it would capture and start to speak some of the the alt text descriptions of your book. Otherwise, you'll hear nothing, right? Um, or that would mean that then you would have to use like an assistive technology to access that information. Um, but these are recommendations that we're now going to these these reading systems and saying, by the way, uh, you're you're not saying the alt text descriptions of your images, or you should have an option to turn that on with the read aloud feature, uh, which we're starting to see, see like Thorium has, et cetera. So, you know, uh, and I know that the W3C were starting to look at uh, fixed layout um, and uh, some of the accessibility challenges. And I know Laura has a lot of knowledge in this space. so. Uh, I, I would defer to, to Laura actually on, on some of that myself, actually. I uh, spoke at a conference in November on uh, accessibility issues and this publisher from Minnesota called Capstone came to me asking me questions about the best way to do alt text for fixed layout books. Um, and then I consulted with Wendy Reed and other people in the publishing working group to because they presented a number of different ways to do it. And you know, it was a it was a good question. And there's lots of ways to come at it. I mean, the simplest is just to use simple alt text. A lot of the times those images don't need to, they don't need long complex descriptions. So that is actually a very simple way to come at it. But it does it does help us come back to this question of knowing how to test. I think that that's actually a skill that we all need. I, I certainly need to learn it. I need to be able to see the world from um, one of our potential readers point of view and um, 
I used the wrong verb there. It shouldn't be see. I need to hear what those books are like and to, to understand how to test a little bit better. And I, I think that that's a, a major piece of the puzzle here. We can write alt text for fixed layout books. I'm not sure that the reading systems are actually picking it up exactly as we mean them to pick it up. And so I think there's still work there to be done. Um, I wanted to circle back to the thing at the beginning about, um, you know, uh, I, I agree with Matt Chan in that this isn't, you know, making an accessible ebook is um, laborious and involves a number of steps, but it actually isn't that hard. Um, I know that sounds crazy to say out loud, especially when it feels like there's a number of barriers in, in front of getting to a place where you're just making really accessible ebooks, especially for micro publishers or um, whatever. So it's not that hard, there, it, but there is work to do to learn how to do it. And, and if we go back to what, um, well, I can't remember who said this yesterday, but I think it was Lori from Seal. She said that that ninety three percent of the content that's being published right now is not accessible. That there still is a real famine in terms of what is getting published right now and how accessible it is. Um, so, if it's not that hard, then why isn't there more content that's meeting standard? And I, and I think that what it boils down to is that publishers need more support. Charles, do you want to, you have your hand raised? Yeah, do you want to come yeah. in here? Sure. Um, I agree with you there. Uh, your point on it's not that hard. And, you know, when we look at a book, let's say Ace gives you, uh, if you run it through the automatic checker, and it gives you like 1,500 errors, right, or warnings, and you're like, oh, my God, how am I going to fix all this? It's like, that's just daunting, right? The problem is, is probably just one or two issues. Mm -hmm. That's really the problem. And you're repeating the same pro mistake over and over and over again. And so it's just calculating and keeps adding those all up. And even, you know, we're seeing with some of the, you know, the publishers, uh, the books that we're looking at, where you, the, I think some of the worst maybe was like eight main issues, but, you know, constitute like, two or 3,000, you know, uh, errors and warnings and the like, but, and we break it down and you're just, okay, now I need to fix that, how to do a link or what have you. It's like, okay, but you have like 500 links now in your book. So you have to go in and fix it. That's the tedious part. The thing is when you fix it in your pipeline so that, you know, you're doing it, fix it once there, then if you just rerun the book through your pipeline, theoretically that could fix like 500 mistakes. So that's just something to, to be aware of that, you know, it, it seems like it's daunting, but uh, it might not really be in actuality. I keep muting myself to take a drink of water so you don't have to hear me slurping and then I forget that I'm muted, sorry. Matt, I think you, want to come in? Uh, just on the note of um, fixing one thing that has a ripple effect that fixes like 500 other things is that um, when we're talking about education and we're talking about um, explaining why um, porn accessible is important, why accessibility is important, I think a good um, addition to that would be to say you know, how would be to explain how easy it is to make changes through um, modifying your tools or your, your tool chain. Um, how if uh, you have limited resources and limited time, you can really amplify the resources and time that you have by making those changes at the tools level. One thing I just want to mention there, uh, Matt, follow on to that is in our certification program, we sort of like, you know, like I mentioned, these are the must fix, these are the next level, and these are the nice to haves. So you have a clear idea of where you need to focus your energy as well. Um, so that these are the things that I must fix. And then it's like, oh, if I, you know what, this one's not that hard. I'll put throw that one in. 
you know, and then you have an accessible book. And then you can always, as you're going later on, you can put it in your roadmap that's like, well, let's knock off this other uh, strongly suggested thing that Benetech says or someone says that would be really nice to improve our accessibility. Um, and you can just sort of like take bite sized chunks, fix the main things that's going to get you certified and passing and, and create an accessible book, and then start looking at these other ones and some of the low hanging fruit that you can uh, easily fix uh, in your pipeline. Um, Chantel? Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to to go back to that, that 1500 number and, and just kind of how it, of errors, kind of how it uh, encapsulates that feeling of, of hitting a wall and not knowing how to approach that or how to go on. And even for, for a much smaller wall, I think it, it can still be really difficult to, to know how to move forward. And one thing that we, a piece of feedback we received after we finished up our training with our publishers with Nels was, great, I've had every question answered that I had up until today, but tomorrow I'm gonna run into a whole bunch of new things that I'm not gonna have this program anymore to, to come back with my questions. Um, and I wondered, Deborah, if this was part of what you had been talking about yesterday about the, the portal. Um, so one suggestion that came out of this program was if we're able to create some kind of recurring meetup or some kind of online forum where when you run into these really specific issues that publishers can have a place that they can meet up and share knowledge and maybe have some expertise available to them um, on a specific issue by issue basis. Yes, that is uh, an excellent question. Thank you, Chantel. So the way we envision it is it sort of being monitored by eBound staff. Um, for two reasons. One, people may not be able to find what they want specifically. Um, hopefully that will be a small instance of uh, people's experience. And then if questions are reoccurring, putting together a forum. Um, part of our Benetech certification process is going to be hiring um, uh, contract people and also training some of our staff to have that certification expertise that will be ongoing. So we will have the ability to dip into their, their knowledge base. But yes, there will have to be ongoing specific, you know, um, feedback loops to get people uh, questions as, as they become, become available. Um, the one thing I, I wanted to raise, this is something Rhianne and I were talking about off, um, off screen. Um, she wonders if it doesn't make sense to include authors in these conversations, especially as they're writing the books from the get-go and, 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 and folding them into the conversation about accessibility, I think makes really good sense. Um, uh, anyway, I, I would love to know what everyone thinks about that, especially people who work directly with authors. So I, I think one of the um, one of the suggestions that came up earlier today, which was around incorporating some of the accessibility language and workflow in your contract, is really important. Um, to, in that way, to in, to incorporate authors as well. I think it's something that really makes sense to talk about. And and I served on the board of the Saskatchewan Writers Guild for seven years. And so accessibility was something that I would bring up at those meetings. And I think it is something that writers need to know about and think about. If they decide to publish, if they don't decide to publish, I think it's a conversation that makes sense for everybody to be a part of who's who's part of the sector. It just it makes sense. I agree. I wonder if it doesn't make sense to talk to somebody like uh, John whose last name I'm not going to remember at the Writers' Union, and to, to be having these conversations in other places as well. Kate, do you want to jump in? Yeah, and I, I don't work directly with authors, but I know something that has come up in discussions around this topic at ACP is, you know, it's, it's and um, Sarah's comments, I think, touched on this too, in terms of the, the technical expertise required to write that alt text. And, and can make those contributions and whether, um, whether all authors are prepared to do that or, or have, have the skill to do it, that's maybe a separate discussion. But 
The other piece on of this, um, and going back to your comment, Laura, about the training and Nancy is doing is is having the skills in house to be able to, you know, take that. Say you do outsource or sit, sit, build it into the author contract, and then the editor gets it. How do they know that it's um, it, it's going to meet the standard required? How do they? What's the editorial work that needs to be done? Um, so it's this whole other workflow that everybody in the editorial process is involved in and it's it's training and, and discussion on on a lot of different different levels i think too you know I, this is a, di a different topic but um you know there's there's marketing and promotion work that authors are sometimes expected or, or take on in terms of social media and some of them are really good at it and some of them mm -hmm. are not as strong at it and and this is another um you know another if it's a joint effort, it's some recognition on both parts of, of what's required and, and playing to people's strengths, I think is important in that too. That's a really good point. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like authors are maybe too close to the content and can't write good alt text because it needs to be a step back. But for really complex things like, you know, bar charts or images that are, um, you know, science diagrams, I think they're the only people who can describe those things well sometimes. Thad, do you want to answer or to jump into the conversation? Yes, yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, just, you know, um, the contrary perspective, I guess, on this one. And when I, um, I do a lot of work with authors over the years as an editor, and then I work with self-published author, authors these days as well. And in, in my view, it's, uh, getting them to tag headings in a Word doc is for me so daunting that most of the time I don't even bother mentioning it to them. As far as they know, the only tool available for formatting a Word document is the tab key. And so then you know, beyond that, I, I, it, I just cringe. Give me physical to, pain. <laughs> to try and get them into alt tagging and and I, you know, structure, please, just some minimal structure. How, how would I do that? Anyway, so you get my point. I, I am just uh, dreading it. Sarah? Hi. Um, I, I'm firmly of the kind of belief in all things that um, if you raise people's awareness and get their buy-in by including them in the conversation, then it can only be a good thing. And I think if authors understood what we were trying to achieve here, the reasons why, and possibly the business case as well, but the more philanthropical, philosophical, philosoph philosophical conversation, um, really, might, really might hit home with them. And if they understood what we we're doing, they might actually be just want to be part of the process. Now we can't lump them all into one bucket and expect them all to behave this in the same way, but there's every chance that a good bunch of authors will get on board and want to be involved. And I think it would be really interesting to include them in these conversations, just to kind of see where they're at and what the level of knowledge and awareness is. Um, at a Nancy, I can speak to the structure, the thing that Thad brought up about structure. Our um, manuscripts come to us and they're often, you know, a dog's breakfast. There's a whole thorough range of what they could look like. Um, and editorial sort of structures them by putting their own kind of markup language around headers and block quotes and small caps and that kind of thing. We're trying to migrate them to actually just formatting but um editors don't like change i don't know if you all know that they don't they're like authors <laughs> they and they don't like being told what to do i've learned um i have them now doing italics properly so that that when something's read into our layout software it doesn't lose the italics which is a you know a step forward but getting them to actually just format the manuscripts properly using built-in styles in Word is um, a real uphill battle.
So it's like a microcosm of the larger conversation about getting authors to put structure into their documents. I know at NELS, um, in some of the work that we've been doing in the publisher education projects, we have been working a little bit directly with authors, um, creating their own alt text for audiobooks and um, and for Braille print books. And I know that like a couple of the authors that I worked with um, for even just regular Braille books, um, there was one author who actually has a blind partner and had no idea that her poetry book was so inaccessible that he would never be able to read it in the way that she created it. Um, and she said that like had she had thought about the process of converting um, her poetry book into Braille at the beginning, she would have written it completely different. Um, and I've talked to a children's um, book author as well who said that like it's really just the process of going through um, audiobook um, creation and alt text and image descriptions and actual graphics and, um, and pictures that you can touch and feel and things like that. And the processes behind those that she also would have, you know, cho chose to write in a different way um, where maybe that alt text necessarily wasn't needed because it was already apparent in the writing. And maybe it's not necessarily text heavy, but maybe just better descriptive language was used instead of relying on the pictures to tell the story. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that like there is something we said about including authors in the process and making the awareness there. But I mean, I think it's definitely like not everybody's gonna buy in. So, like Laura said, people can be stubborn and, and not be, you know, can be very resistant to change, right? And, yeah. and um, I understand that like, it's a creative process too, right? Um, so you don't want to interrupt the creativity, but it's hard to think of new ways to make that creativeness accessible. Um, I work with a publisher called Book Hug. I make all of their eBooks. Um, they mm -hmm. are, they do a lot of experimental stuff, a lot of poetry, a lot of stuff that looks interesting on the page, but doesn't translate accessibly very well. Um, and I, I have actually trained their layout people and trained the publisher on how to do this a little bit differently. And they're now actually pushing back on their authors and saying, um, if we're going to make an accessible ebook of this, it's not going to work. So maybe you want to rethink that page. They're regularly sending things back to their writers and asking them to rethink it from an accessibility point of view. And they're hoping to be in Ebound's accessibility pilot or certification pilot, and they're taking this very seriously. And it's really nice to see, especially for a small literary publisher that does really experimental stuff. So it's possible. Um, Charles, do you want to come into the conversation? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's really interesting how an author would um, decide to adjust how they're going to write a book based on making it accessible. And it actually has a lot of parallels to the uh, video industry um, that if you have a video that you've created and now you have closed captioning, right? Um, which is all the spoken part, but then you have to have described audio on what's happening in the scene that doesn't have any, any, um, any spoken parts to it. And there's some, actually, I think a Canadian uh, group is doing this where they're, they're changing the manuscript. They're, they're basically telling the authors, let's not have the need for described audio. Let's describe what we're doing in the, in the narrative, uh, you know, and then wouldn't need it. And a simple example was they showed a, uh, a video where this uh, real estate agent basically dropped a sign in front of the house uh, that there's an open house to, right? And then they walk in the door where, where no text was spoken. But instead it's like, let me just put this, uh, you know, open house uh, sign here uh, to uh, draw in uh, the, the customers or what have you. And and then you didn't need the described audio. So it was really a neat neat thing that I saw a couple of years ago uh, at, a, at a summit, um, but uh, has this idea that we could actually do this in books too, which is, a neat concept.
Um, one of the questions on my initial remit that we haven't really swung around to is the question of how to best manage the conversation when conversion work is outsourced. And I want, this is a fairly big question. Um, and I wonder if people want to talk about that, if that's something worthwhile here. I, I think it is. I, I don't, we don't outsource what we do at Anansi, but I know a lot of publishers do, especially small publishers through eBound and otherwise. Um, and I think it's worthy of, you know, structuring some comments around. Karen, do you want to weigh in? Sure. I was going to actually raise this. Um, so most I read your mind. <laughs> you did. You read my mind twice today now. So that's kind of scary. <laughs> um, most of my members uh, do not create their own ebooks. They outsource them. And in fact, one of the ones that I spoke with before the panel, they send their um, content to a company in the Philippines. Uh, prior to that, they were sending it to a country, uh, uh, company in India. And so it makes me wonder, how do we meet the accessibility requirements for those EPUB files that are being created overseas or outside of Canada? Um, and what can we do to build capacity within Canada uh, so that there are economical options? Because obviously they're doing it for business reasons um, because it's cheaper. And so how do we build capacity in Canada so we can keep that work here and, um, and have it be as relevant as possible to the standards and the goals that we have? That's are, my burning question for today. These are big, big questions. Um, and the question of keeping the work in Canada is one that um, I, I honestly keeps me awake at night. Um, it's hard to be competitive with overseas conversion houses. But if this whole big, huge accessibility project is going to be successful after the five years of what the Canada Book Fund has been tasked with, we need to be able to remediate eBooks with Canadian labor and we need to be able to convert books in Canada. We need to have a pool of labor who can do that work. And building that capacity is a really big deal. Um, Deb, do you wanna, you, you, yes. you look like you're so gonna. You're gonna uh, yeah, explode. I'm gonna yes, <laughs> no, not, not explode. Um, yes, um, we all feel the pain of having to outsource our content. Um, no, you know, beyond our borders. Um, in our public, in our uh, Benetech certification pilot, we um, got approval to get one Canadian supplier or conversion partner certified, Benetech certified. And we've got feelers out to a number of different organizations who are looking internally to address exactly the issue you brought up, Laura, is can they afford to, to get this business? Can they afford to do this work? Um, so at some point, we're going to have to have a serious conversation about, you know, at what point and to what ex expense do we keep it in Canada or not? Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is eBound partnered with Nels last year and we did a best practices in outsourcing your content for accessible conversion. Um, and I will share the link to that um, in our chat. It talks about what the publishers can do internally to, to start the process of making their workflow accessible. Um, it talks about how to have conversations with your conversion partner, what to ask for. And as you know, it's a chart with 15 different topics and questions they can ask. And then the last part is talking about how do they QA it when they get the, their files back from their conversion partners. So it's a really specific hands-on tool um, to make people aware of it, its existence. I know ideally everybody would build the capacity internally, but I think conversion partners do play a role, particularly in handing a huge backlist, right? Because publishers don't want to go back and touch it twice. Um, but I think by even having these conversations with conversion partners, they're building the capacity to, to know what to look for. And if you know how to test for it, it's the first step in figuring out how to integrate it from the beginning next time. Okay, so many hands raised, it's very exciting. Jillian? Um, it's, I think that there's a role here with, with regional partners and, and regional um, provincial governments as well. Um, I know that like the majority of, of, of Canada have 
uh, of Canadian provinces have governments that are very interested in developing local economies. And so one of the things that happens um, with, some of, with some of the publishing grants available and publishing support available provincially, certainly in Saskatchewan, is that publishers' applications can be ranked higher if they are in, in the adjudication process, if they are using local um, people to do, whether it's conversion or whether it's, it's doing any form of any part of the production right off the hop. So that's an incentive to, to get, you know, to sort of to keep this um, part of the workflow in Canada. The challenge then becomes on the, in the long term, making sure that you have the, those people locally who can do it. And so, you know, that's something that we've been looking at for a while as well. But I think there is a role there for uh, economic development and, and looking at looking outside of, of government departments, not for a handout, but, but for incentives and, and working with ministries of trade and, and um, you know, just finding ways of maybe even looking at other jurisdictions, like what they do with, with tax credits, perhaps in some of the film industries, which I know that's kind of a dirty word in some places but anyway that's that was my thinking there Brad I think you're next do you want to jump in who's that yeah that's you yep oh okay sorry a, a question on this as, as some of you know I consult to Canadian Electronic Library in Ottawa who do a ton of this conversion and are Benetech certified However, they do farm out the hands-on part to India. So does that then create the perception they're not Canadian? Or are you Canadian if you manage the projects in Canada but outsource a portion of the labor? How do people see that? That's a good question. And, and my take on this is I would like to see the work staying here completely and All being done by Canadian hands. but. Um, I'd love to hear what other people think of that. Um, so I'll jump in if that's okay. Yeah. Um, when we put the, um, the request for quotes for our digital accessible publishing project, <clears throat> there was no, no one in Canada who could compete, um, first of all, my, uh, for the price, and secondly, for the capacity to deliver in a timely fashion. And so we are going outside of Canada for this project, which, um, which really bothers me, but the, the, Canadian, um, the Canadian quotes were just not competitive. What a bummer. I know you work with, with Bob. Is, is that still the perception that it's sort of half Canadian or something like that? Um, to us, it's it's not Canadian if we're farming it out to India. But but um, even if the head office and the control of the project is in Canada, we could debate that. Tad. Yeah, yeah, that's the question in my mind is how it's perceived. Yeah, and it was it was a back and forth. Um, Sarah and I had several conversations about this because. Um, we, our value is to keep the work in Canada and yet uh, from a practical project management even uh, position, we couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just to jump in quickly, um, because Eben has been managing uh, many of these uh, conversion projects, it's also a, an issue of um, international capacity. So, um, you know, these, these conversion partners are getting really backed up with all these projects they're feeling it as well. Um, and so not only do we look for cost, we look at timelines, we also look at quality. Now CEL is Benetech approved, so that's great. But from a timelines perspective, we all have, you know, <laughs> fiscal year ends that we need to have content delivered by. So that's where there's another complicating factor. Kevin here from the Libraries Co-op. Can I share some thoughts? Yep. Hey, um, I'm the Executive Director of the BC Libraries Co-op, where the, the NELS is one of this one of our services, um, and uh, we're working very closely with CELA on a number of fronts. 
what I'm about to offer is not a panacea for this question. I'll give you my own bias to the question of um, at what level of work would the work qualify for being Canadian? As a, as a organization that employs testers with lived experience who lived in Canada, live in Canada, um, it, my preference would be for us to try to um, have processes or um, des desires as much as we can so that we're employing folks who in this country and uh, where we can folks with lived experience. And I think there's a number of good reasons for that. Um, one of the things, it's not complete, but one of the things that allows us to contribute to this work, in addition to the funding, the five-year cycle of funding from the Canada Book Fund has been an annual allotment from the federal government through Minister Qualtro's office, if folks are aware of this. It's $4 million a year split between CELA and NELS. And um, that's been going on for a number of years. Money for which we're extremely grateful. Money which actually covers the cost of this summit and has. So just hear me out. In the fall, we received notice from the federal government that for the first time, um, there would be multi a multi-year commitment to this funding that decreases by 25% over the next three years to zero. So at the, uh, for this fiscal, CELA and NELS have a, a total of $4 million to do accessible publishing work nationally. Next year, we will have $3 million from the federal government and so on and so on until three or four years down the road, there's nothing allocated. Now, of course, we're advocating for that not to happen and that not to be the case. But I, I do want to point out that there could be a, a, a collective conversation with the federal government about the benefit of that funding and possibly other types of funding uh, to how we think about the nature of this work over the long term. And, and I, I, I just wanted to highlight that because I do think it, it could impact uh, in one component um, uh, the capacity in Canada uh, for folks in Canada to be a part of the overall solution to this question. Thank you. Sarah, do you want, I, you've had your hand raised for a bit. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I just wanted to come back to the question maybe of conversion projects. Um, I, I know we recently released the third call for projects and we, we looked at this, the question of capacity in the context of that call and in the way that we structured the call. So one of the things we've done is we've we put an initial cap on conversion projects, but open the door for the possibility that if there's a conversion project that can demonstrate that there is um, uh, a component that is building capacity within Canada, that that funding could exceed that cap. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're seeing a number of conversion projects underway in different parts of the country. Um, and it's sort of a conversation that we've been talking a lot about internally the idea of and I talked about it a bit yesterday but that sort of longer term legacy of the project or the the initiative and the idea of you know the more people that are doing accessible publishing work within Canada in wh wherever that's coming from whether that's coming from the schools whether that's coming from within companies whether that's Canadian companies that are you know whether that's collective internships whatever that looks like um, we think that there's there's space to maybe tackle it in different ways. We don't have the answer um, for sure as to you know what is the long term. But I think that the point that I would make in terms of um, uh, competitive quotes is that in some instances there is an interest um, when it comes to public funders in other factors or other considerations like um, the public good of, of seeing, um, you know, capacity being built within Canada. That's fantastic. All of that is so great, Sarah. Thank you for jumping in. Um, it's uh, really nice to see that being prioritized. Um, Charles and Thad both have your hand raised. Is it on purpose or is it lingering? Sure. 
<laughs> okay, I, go ahead, Charles. Um, yeah, this whole thing about, you know, having the conversion part of it overseas is, unfortunately, it's it's reality because you can't pay, even here in the U.S., we can't pay someone in the U.S., and you sure can't pay someone in Canada the salary to that for minimum wage even to to do these descriptions uh, that, uh, you know, we're competing against folks that are doing it for like nickels and dimes uh, overseas, potentially. Um, it's just, you know, the thing is the then the, the publisher to do that would then have to pass those costs on to the consumer. And you're not going to have a person that, you know, you have two books out there that are very similar, one done with Canadian, you know, conversion vendor that's doing everything in Canada and it costs like 15 times more than a book with the exact same content. It's not like, you know, farmers and you have the organic option versus the, you know, the uh, the commercial product that you give a customers a choice. P customers are gonna look and go, oh, I, I can't spend, you know, 50, you know, $50 on this book where I can get the same book practically for five bucks or less. Um, so I, I think it's inevitable, but I think that having it, um, you know, um, managed in Canada, you know, like the um, Canadian Electronic Library is doing, and then, you know, there that's just quality control. That's, you know, where you're going to get them to, uh, to sign off and say, yeah, the work that we're getting you know, is to our high standards and, uh, you know, and they can be competitive versus, you know, if they had to do it all in Canada, you, you're just not going to get that, uh, that same price at all, not even close. Can I just jump in there just for a second, Laura? Yeah. Um, I will say that maybe one difference in Canada um, is that we do offer federal funding for internships, both mm -hmm. for individual publishers and for um, organizations and associations. It's not a long-term solution, like I, I totally get that, but it is a capacity building piece yep. that I, we've seen a number of publishers use very effectively in very different ways. And we, and we are, um, we have done a couple of rounds of funding now that, that includes accessibility as one area that you can use a technology in turn um, um, to, things like that that you can work on. So, I mean, there, there, is, there are opportunities here as well that may not be available elsewhere. We have an excellent tech intern at Nancy who um, I, I don't want to tell her about the eBound certification pilot because she might jump ship and then I will be mad. <laughs> um, Kate, do you wanna? Oh, you're muted, Kate. I, details, details. My hand down, oh, down instead of unmuting. Um, but both were needed. Um, building on what Sarah was just saying about where there might be opportunities, and this is, I, I really appreciate the comments that have been made about the, the you know, the bottom line and, and the economics of all of this, but I think of a couple of examples of, of smaller publishers who um, early in the, the journey through ebook development actually ended up selling those services to small U.S. presses who didn't have that capacity in-house. Mm -hmm. And as a, we have a small market here and there's um, fewer companies here, which is a, a factor around all these discussions around capacity building. But if, and this is the blue sky thinking piece, but if it, if this opportunity and a legacy of the CBF initiative is um, positioning Canadian publishers and whether it's independent publishers or service providers who work with them as experts in this field, does that allow us um, an export opportunity to, to have other publishers in other com countries coming to us for this work um, and bringing, I mean, that's just earned revenue towards someone's bottom line, right? But also making, making the services available to Canadians first. It's a fantastic question. Um, before I went to work at Anansi about three years ago, I was doing conversions on my own, running a sort of a conversion house, and more than 50% of my um, clients were American. Uh, so there was a lot of business coming from there, uh, and there, there's still lots of potential for sure, and I think that's a really good way to look at it, to monetize those skills. 
Yeah, and just one more, I mean, another industry that benefits from that, Canadian printers who have a, a, a the dollar working in their favor as well, but they they do a ton of business with US companies mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and have excellent quality and service, of course. That's a good point. <clears throat> Um, Deb, I don't want to, um, I would, don't want you to forget to drop that link about how to talk to conversion partners um, in the chat. I, I did a quick look around for that on your website, but I couldn't find it. So thanks. Have we solved all the problems? What are the Laura? outstanding questions? Sorry, who One, spoke? Yep. Charles, hi. Um, I'm wondering about uh, page numbers um, and what you all are like, where is this? Um, we have like are a lot of Canadian publishers doing both print and digital or all digital first. And uh, where does page numbers fit into, into all of this? Uh, it's definitely something that we grapple with and you know, in the GCA and trying to get those page numbers to be done. Um, but just was wondering for uh, for your all's perspective on that. I can tell you what we do at Anansi. Um, we definitely put print corollary page numbers in all of our eBooks. We use a script that I worked with um, uh, a guy in New Zealand to develop the script for me that works in InDesign and then there's a post export script to translate what we call those page stakes to the actual page list so that somebody can navigate by a a print page numbers. It's an important piece of the accessibility puzzle, this page list thing. That's how we work at Anansi. I'm curious to hear about how other people approach this issue. really mostly publisher support organizations here, not publishers. So maybe don't know the answer. (laughs) Matt, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, and and we do it the way that Laura described because we're so married to um, an InDesign first workflow. So if that is not the case for the specific publisher that you're advising, then that may, then what Laura just said may not you know, be as applicable, although it certainly is like a a very good way of doing it. That's an important correction. Thanks, Matt. Sarah? Um, I wondered if I could put a question on the table. We've talked a lot about eBooks. I was wondering if there's particular publisher needs or issues around with working with audiobooks and audiobook production. I know it's often not done in house, but um, just wondering if we could maybe have a bit of a conversation about that. Jillian? So yeah, we're that's I'm really glad you asked about this, Sarah, because that's something that that we're we've been surveying our publishers about through, particularly because of the programming that we're offering um, currently for audiobook production. And what we've discovered is that there's an awful lot of people who are doing audiobooks, and there's an awful lot of people who are doing them themselves, and that's great. But there's not an awful lot of people that even know that there are accessibility issues in audiobooks. And so um, we just found some of the uh, best practices from the NELS website that, that we're going to be incorporating into, into our audiobook mentorship programs. And for the subsidy that we want to be able to offer to our publishers, we're, we're needing those books, those audiobooks that they produce to be accessible. Um, and I, it's, it's an important question to ask because I think with, public, with micro publishers, I'm not sure that they know that an audiobook isn't just automatically accessible. And I, I'm not sure that they know what accessibility features might be in an audiobook. So I think there's some PD there that, that can really be utilized.
Yeah, it's Chantal here. I'll also jump in to say that that was uh, when we did a survey after our wrap up of our ebooks um, training and file reviews with Nels. That was one of the feedback that we received as well. Can we get accessible audiobook training next, please? So, yeah, it's definitely uh, something that would be very valuable. Um, and we've been working for a number of years, I mentioned this at the beginning, um, with the CNIB to create uh, accessible e audiobooks. <clears throat> and their process is to create the accessible version first and then to um, kind of st strip it down a bit, I guess, to make it into the, the, um, the general audiobook that's for sale. Um, a lot of our members are also working with ECW Press with David Karen to produce audiobooks. Um, and I'm actually not sure if those are all accessible or not. Their ECW's processes are, they, they would hit the majority of the accessibility standards. We discovered this week talking to ECW. Okay. Um, and then the other piece for, for our members, um, we have one publisher who's actually producing e-audiobooks herself, um, but most of them would go outside their company to help them produce. ECW and, um, is definitely on the ball. Sorry, I interrupted somebody, apologies. No, that's, that's fine. Um, no, I was just gonna mention that, you know, with Bookshare uh, at Benetech, all of the books that come in can get converted into an audiobook, a Daisy audiobook. So, uh, you know, we have like close to a million books now that are is in our library that could be potentially converted into an audiobook on demand. Um, and some of these now with the Marrakesh Treaty um, and uh, the, you know, those those uh, open books, uh, free public domain books, uh, there's a potential there for getting access to that. I'm pretty sure Nels does that kind of thing as well, the conversion to Daisy Talking Books. Yeah. Oh, Deb says eBound is in the process of completing a best practices and outsourcing audiobook creation guide. That's great. That's perfect. That's exactly what a lot of us need. Yeah. Chantel, do you want to say that comment in the ch in, in, live and in person? Sure. Oh, great. I just, uh, <laughs> when Charles, you had asked about the page numbers, I just tried to bring up a recent document on my computer here. We put out a call for um, accessible ebooks for our library pilot project. And we had worked with Nels to come up with a checklist for publishers to check off the various accessibility features that were part of their EPUB 3s. And we had asked about tagging page numbers and page list. And I just brought it up to see kind of how many of them had checked off that specific one and very few, I would say maybe five to 10 of the uh, 400 books that are on that submission list. Um, but then I um, also noted that in our feedback um, on the, the recent PD that we offered, that was a specific request for um, what our next PD sessions um, might be around. So I think, yeah, that I wouldn't have any knowledge really on how they've been approaching it because it doesn't seem like it's been one of the steps that they've uh, really made it to yet but it's definitely something that they've learned about and heard about over the past few months and are starting to think about how they can incorporate that more I just dropped a link into the chat. Um, this is um, details about the page list script that I use. It's in this article and I'm happy to share the scripts that I use, Chantal, if you want to email me or hit me up and I'm, I'm happy to do a little demo about how to use them for your members, for sure. I, I think page list is really a very simple way to really level up your ebook production. And um, there's no way to do it automatically from InDesign, so the scripting solution is the best way that I know. Um, I'm being told that we have two minutes left here and then we need to go back to the main room. Any, any, any parting shots? Any last salvos? I'd just like to like say that from like my former work was in the education sector in all formats and um, 
pagination was like a deal breaker if you didn't have it for book club or for yeah. you know your classroom use like that like that that was half of the remediation work that I used to do yeah was for print pagination so the fact that it's being incorporated now is huge so thank you <laughs> Matt uh, preaching to the choir here, I know, but the the capacity building piece that we discussed today, so, so important to me. Um, I think we take it for granted a little bit um, that we here in North America and in Canada specifically have the expertise to be leaders in this accessibility space. But if you don't do the work, then, yeah. you know, you, you don't get to continue to, to do that. Agreed. It's like I trained you or something. <laughs> okay, we're, we're now being told to go back to the main room. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll be carrying this conversation on again tomorrow. So please come back if you want to. We're going to solve all the world's problems, I promise. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Laura. Thank you.